We're glad to have you folks again here for our YouTube service, hopefully our last YouTube service, as the governor has put in place some things to be able to get things back opened up. And we're hoping and praying as we meet with our deacons and trustees that we will be able to be back and meeting together safely here at our church next Sunday for Mother's Day. And we look forward to seeing that, having two Sunday morning services and being safe about our meeting for a little while longer. But we'll be in a building and I'll be able to be preaching to people and I am looking forward to that so very much. And uh, so we will have a letter out to you uh, hopefully during this week to be able to let you know what our plans are. And if you have your Bibles this morning, and I hope that you do as you listen to us, we're going to be in Acts chapter number 4. In Acts chapter number 4, beginning in verse 23 and going down through verse number 31. And we are going to look at the persecuted prayer. Acts chapter number 4, beginning in verse number 23. We break into our story there. Talking about Peter and John as they had been arrested before the Sanhedrin and were being let go. We see here in verse 23, and being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that they and when they heard that they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hath made heaven and earth and the sea and all that it, all that in them is. Whom who by the mouth of thy servant David hath said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined, before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to hear, to heal, excuse me, and that signs and wonders may be done by thy name, done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word with boldness. Let us go to a word of prayer and be into our message here this morning. Our Father, we come and thank you again that we have this time to be able to worship you and to be able, dear Lord, to hear from your word. And we ask now, Father, that you will speak to our hearts this morning. We pray that your spirit would work and bless. We ask that everything we do may lift up Christ and that you'll keep our people safe and that, Lord, you'd bring us back together again. We pray very soon, even this next week, that we may worship together, that God would receive the glory in and through all things. We just ask now, Father, that everything we do may lift up the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. For this now, Father, we do ask and we pray. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. It has been said that fortune favors the bold. And I believe that this is true to an extent. The Bible teaches us that the fearful and slothful will not accomplish anything. And that is definitely true, usually because of fear. If we take no risks, we won't receive any reward. This is one of the lessons that is taught to us in the parable of the talents of Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. We're familiar with the story of a man, a king, going on a far journey and being able to give to his servants 
according to their abilities his wealth. And the servant that had five of the talents of the rich man went and went to the exchangers and took a risk. And he received double five more talents. And the one that was given two talents also took a risk and put that money to the exchangers. And that risk was rewarded with two more talents. The one that was given one, though, didn't take a risk at all. He just took his talent and buried it in his yard. And when the reckoning time came of the master coming back, he only had his one that he was given. He was called a wicked and slothful servant. Where the others were rewarded, well done thou good and faithful servant. So we need to be bold for the cause of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We need to take risks. That word bold there means to be fearless before danger and showing or requiring a fearless, daring spirit. According to merriamwebster.com slash dictionary slash bold. And here in the book of Acts, as you read through this history of the early church, <coughs> excuse me, you find examples of boldness of the apostles and of the early church to spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ throughout the world. In this coronavirus pandemic, many were caught up in fear and weren't bold for the Lord Jesus Christ. There were churches that continued to hold services. They did so safely. They did so wisely, continuing to make a difference in their communities. When our governor of Kansas here limited churches to less than 10 parishioners in a service. There were two Baptist churches in western Kansas that stood up for their religious freedom and sued the state of Kansas. And I wish them the best in their suit. It is my prayer that they will win. And I wish our church had been bolder during this time of pandemic. In Acts chapter 4, we see that Peter and John here were arrested by the Sanhedrin court for preaching Jesus Christ and his resurrection. And for a noted miracle that took place back in the gospel, back in the book of Acts chapter 3, where Peter had performed a miracle for a lame man who begged at the beautiful gate of the temple. And as we read there in Acts chapter 4, the Sanhedrin court could not dispute the miracle. But they punished Peter and John and charged them not to preach in the name of Jesus Christ. Their response to this was bold. Their prayer that we read in our text this morning is also bold. Well, let's have a look. at this prayer this morning we see in verse 23 and being let go they went to their company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them we notice their report of the persecution that they had suffered in order to get that full story we need to be able to go back a little bit in our chapter We see, first of all, the notable miracle that took place all the way back in Acts chapter 3. Where a man who was lame from birth, there it says in verse number 2 of Acts chapter 3, was carried by, by friends and people who knew him and laid there at the beautiful gate of the temple asking alms. He was a beggar. And he begged <clears throat> for his living. He saw Peter and John being able to go into the temple there about the hour of prayer, about the ninth hour of three o'clock in the afternoon, as it mentions in verse number one of Acts chapter three. 
And Peter put his eyes upon him with John. <coughs> and in verse number 4 of Acts chapter 3, he says there, look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting something of them. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give unto thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. And Peter took this man by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength, and he leaped up and stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And we see in verse number 16, going back to Acts chapter 4, in verse number 16, we see the Sanhedrin's response as they deliberated on what to do with Peter and John. They were saying, what shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle had been done by them is manifest to all of them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. The miracle that had been done to this lame man was indisputable. For he had come to be with them. They saw the evidence of this notable miracle. And that miracle spread throughout all Jerusalem. And the Sanhedrin wanted to squash it. Verse 17 of Acts chapter 4, it says there, But that it spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name, this name of Jesus. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. They were basically telling them, do not preach the gospel. They were basically telling them, do not tell people of Jesus Christ. And we find that throughout the world today. The world wants us to not preach that gospel. The, Lord, the world wants us not to tell people of Christ and his great love for them. The world does not want us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. To tell people that their lives can be changed through the word of God and the gospel. They want to silence us. And the government used this coronavirus and the fear of it, I believe, to try to do just that. But we find in verses 19 and 20 the response of Peter and John. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 19. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God, not in the sight of men, not in the sight of the Sanhedrin court, right in the sight of God, that is what we must do as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We must do what the Word tells us to do. We must do, thus saith the Lord, not thus saith men. Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Peter and John, apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, who were taught by the Lord Jesus Christ for three and a half years, every single day. 
Peter and John, part of that inner circle of three of Peter, James, and John, who saw things that the other disciples and the other apostles had not seen. Took the advanced class under the Lord Jesus Christ that the other disciples did not. Proclaimed. We cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Peter and John were basically telling the Sanhedrin court, we are going to continue to tell people about Jesus and his death and his burial and his resurrection. For in Acts chapter 5, they said, we ought to obey God rather than men. That's bold. And we need to be bold. The day and age in which we live. We need to proclaim the word of God and the things which we have seen and we have heard. The things that the Lord has done for us, we need to tell others today, now more than ever. And we need to be bold in our witness and bold in our testimony. No matter what it costs. We must be bold. We see the body of the prayer beginning in verse 24 down through verse number 30. The reverence of the persecuted. When they had heard that report, when Peter and John had reported unto them what they had gone through. The Bible says there in verse 24, when they, when they heard that report, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord. And said, Lord, thou art God, which hath made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. Who by the mouth of thy servant David had said, why, do, why did the heathen, heathen rage? And the people imagined vain things. The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. And of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed both Herod King Herod of Christ's day, and Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, with the Gentiles, the people of Israel, were gathered together for to do whatever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. We see their prayer was united there in verse 24. They lifted up their voice, the Bible says, with one accord. The Bible says that the church should be united together with one cause, with one goal of reaching the world with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Seeing souls saved and seeing lives changed through the preaching and the teaching of the word of God. coronavirus pandemic or not.
Paul, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippian church in Philippians chapter 1. And in verse number 27. He speaks there of the unity of the church at Philippi. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27. The Bible tells us there, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Let your manner of living show what you believe. Show the word of God and the gospel. That whether I come to see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs. That ye stand fast, stand firm, stand up in one spirit, with one mind, unified, striving together. For the faith of the gospel. The church in the book of Acts, the early church, was a unified church. They worked together. We need to be together. Can't have the preacher leading one way and the people of the church going another. We've got to work together. And if we work together with a common goal, if we work together with a common interest of getting out the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, we will see fruit for our labor. And we will see those that will come Forward to, try, to, to proclaim Christ as their Savior. We will see the baptismal water stirred again. We will be able to see the Holy Spirit of God working and moving in the hearts and lives of His people. Their prayer was united. They praised the Lord God's power. Last parrot of verse 24 through verse 26. The power of his mighty hand of creation who created all things. Heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. Thou art God. Great and mighty God. God has the power to change lives. God has the power to save souls. God has the power to do all things. God has the power to move leaders, presidents, kingdoms. The Bible says he can raise them up or tear them down. In quoting Psalm 2, verses 1 and 2, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. The world is anti-Christ, anti-God. Our leaders 
are wishing to throw out Christianity from our society, the mention of God from our world. They are raging against the Lord and against His Christ. But the thing that we notice that as they prayed of them delivering Christ up to be crucified on Calvary's cross, they noted there that God's will and the Lord's will was done. In verse 27, of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod, the Jewish king, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, God used them all, gathered them all together. So that at Calvary's cross, God's will would be done. God's will that Christ should give his life and lay down his life that we might have eternal life through him. That the gospel would become a reality. That salvation of souls would become ours. Through the one who gave his life for us. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. The Bible says they that they My brain wish I had a better one. They that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We may be able to examine ourselves and to examine our lives and ask ourselves, are we persecuted in any way? If we are not, then maybe we're not living as godly in Christ Jesus as we should. Because the Bible says if you're going to take a stand for the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're going to preach the gospel, you're going to suffer persecution. That's why so many today don't take a stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't want to suffer. They want to fit in. Fit into the world. And compromise. They're preaching and they're teaching and what they believe and compromise the word of God. We cannot compromise the word of God. We must follow, thus saith the Lord. We must follow God's will. For our hearts, for our life, for our church. In verses 29 and 30, they made their requests. Their request was for their servants to have boldness to speak thy word. A boldness that is needed today. We need to pray for boldness. That we would tell people about Christ and not be sorry for it.
that we would pray for those who are lost and not be sorry for it. The day and age in which we live with the shortness of the time that we have because Jesus is coming again and I believe he's coming again soon, we need to be bold. Take some risks. Get out of our comfort zone. Do some things that we have never done before. So that people will be able to hear the word of God and people will have the chance to get saved. They prayed for healing. Signs and wonders may be done in the name of Jesus. The greatest signs and wonders that we can see today are people... who become born again, who are regenerated, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Who come to give their heart and life for the Lord Jesus Christ. For young men and young women and older men and older women to come surrender their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ and for his service, saying, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And to see God's hand and the Lord's hand move in our hearts and in our lives and in our church and in our community, in our state and nation and around the world. For in Romans 1 and verse 16, the Bible says that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Did God hear their prayer? Yes, he did. God answered their prayer? Yes, he did. We see that in verse 31 in Acts chapter 4 of our text. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 31, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. The results of the persecuted's prayer. The place shook. Physical shaking like an earthquake. Shook to its core. Again, demonstrating the great power and the almighty hand of our God. And our Savior, Jesus Christ, who said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. The Gospel of Matthew 28 and verse 18. And the Lord Jesus Christ shares his power with us as he gives us the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. Back in Acts chapter 1 and in verse number 8, the Bible says, And ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. We have power. 
We have the power of God if we know Christ is our personal Savior. The power of God indwells us in the Holy Spirit. We have the power to do the will of the Lord. We have the power to endure the persecution that the world will throw out at us. We have the power to make a difference in people's lives. By giving them the word of God and the gospel. We have the power to fulfill God's great commission. God gives us this power to be witnesses, the Bible says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, unto him. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. Both at the same time, simultaneously, in Jerusalem, right here, and in all Judea and in Samaria, our state and our nation, and up to the uttermost part of the earth, the entire world, simultaneously. Some may say, preacher, that can't be done. Oh, it can. And it is. And there needs to be more. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had control of their heart and their life. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5 and in verse 18, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. We are to let the Holy Spirit of God have control of our heart and control of our life. Control of our life, just as alcohol has control of the drunkard. That we can't live our life without the Holy Spirit of God. That we can't live our life without His presence, without His moving, without His control. But in order for the Holy Spirit of God to have control of our life, we've got to yield ourselves to Him. And say, as Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane before he was crucified, not my will, but thy will be done. And they spoke God's word with boldness. They were unashamed. They didn't apologize. Oh, I'm sorry that I'm preaching this. They proclaimed God's word and they were bold. I make no apologies for being a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. I make no apologies. That I'm concerned about other men and women, and boys and girls, and want to see them come to know Christ and to be saved. To see parents raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. To see godly households living for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm not ashamed to say that I pray for my people. I pray for our young people that as they may hear the call of God on their life, they would answer that call as the Apostle Paul did, saying, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And then go to do it. That we would all live our life pleasing unto the Lord. I make no apologies. Do you? 
Are you sorry that you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you sorry that you're a Christian? Don't be. Old song goes, I'll tell the world that I'm a Christian. I am not ashamed. His name to bear. I'll tell the world that I'm a Christian. I'll take him with me everywhere. Will you take the Lord Jesus Christ with you everywhere? Will you tell everyone with boldness? Take a risk so that people will get saved. We need that today more than ever. Would you answer the call? Would you come to Christ as Savior? Would you give your life to serve Him? It is my prayer today that you will. And if you do, the Lord will surely bless you. I thank you so much for your time and attention today. We'll be back this evening, continuing in James, finishing up, Lord willing, James chapter 1. In our study of maturity, becoming the mature believer that the Lord wants us to be with boldness. Until tonight, we pray that the Lord will bless you.